Whoa, look at that. You expect the unexpected when you adopt eight kids. Loud. Loud. Active. <laughs> Messy, sticky, <laughs> stinky. <laughs> but Ray and Lori Carter say they still didn't expect this. Shauna filmed a few seconds of it just because I mean, I, I don't know. He just like lost it and attacked me. And he was just like flight or flight livid with, I can't be at that school. Trey was born with fetal alcohol syndrome. It has impaired his ability to control his emotions and to learn. In second grade, Forsyth County placed him in a special education classroom at Kelly Mill Elementary. It didn't go well. On day one, I think, he was restrained. To calm Trey's fight or flight tendencies, Teachers used physical restraints. What we're trying to do is apply physical touch to get that child to calm down and de-escalate. That's Jennifer Caracciolo, a spokesperson for the district. According to school reports provided by Trey's parents, staff restrained Trey 20 times in his first month. Trey ended up at Children's Health Care of Atlanta, depressed and anxious. For threatening to kill himself, and, or th threatening self-harm and harm to the teacher. But as soon as he returned to class, the restraints started again. Each only lasted a few minutes. The reports outlined the danger, pushing, punching, or climbing the door, hoping to leave the room. Trey's mom believes he couldn't do the schoolwork and lacked maturity to deal with his frustration. Try harder is something Trey can't hear because he's been told to try harder and that just jacks up his anxiety. Oh, I mean, you know, if you had a wheelchair, would you tell somebody to try harder to walk? Trey has a brain injury. He has an invisible disability and it, and, and it needed to be accommodated. It almost always happened in the morning, but the reports don't say what triggered the aggression. I get it. We don't always, we miss some cues, but that's an awful lot of cues to miss. Dr. Daniel Crimmins is an emeritus professor at Georgia State, a clinical psychologist that for more than a decade can result in the same outcome as the has helped train schools on ways to avoid restraints. He says restraints aren't generally harmful, but they don't help either, burning up time and resources. How do we switch that equation from them being invested to reacting to the problem to to preventing the problem and, and teaching a skill that might teach it, that might help this kid in the future. According to the Office of Civil Rights, that year, Forsyth used restraints at least three times more than any of the four larger metro school districts. For perspective, Forsyth used restraints more than 900 times last school year. After that, the district with the highest use was Paulding County. They used restraints 300 times. Crimmins says the other counties aren't being honest in their reporting, or Forsyth has a distinct culture for how it handles students with special needs. If I am being restrained, the message is that I'm truly that I'm being disapproved of. Um, if it's happening that often, that's a pretty heavy burden of disapproval to be carrying around. Caracciolo says the use of restraints spiked in 2017 when Trey attended in person, and there's since been a philosophical shift. We're very data driven. We have conversations about, okay, why is this data happening? Do we need to provide more training? It's those conversations that led more than half of the district schools to now use PBIS, a program to focus on supporting positive behavior. It's also tracking students' behavior so we can see if there's triggers. In the past five years, Forsyth added 18% more special education students, but its use of restraints increased 5%. Caracciolo says it's a sign parents believe the district is doing things right. And sometimes that still means physical restraint. We've obviously evolved it over the years to make sure that we're providing the best support for the students and their families, but it's a practice that has worked for us. It's not a practice that has worked for Trey. Restraints didn't cause his problems, but his parents say they have made it almost impossible to get him back into a traditional classroom. Trey's mom let us listen in on a team meeting before Trey left a residential treatment program stemming from this attack. He did have some fear about returning back to that school and he talked a little bit about the restraints that happened. Restraints, still a fear five years later. Trey never went back to Kelly Mill after second grade because his parents said the district wouldn't let him change schools. 
So instead, he has bounced between private schools, home-based classes, and psychiatric hospitals. I don't know what 20-something restraints the first few weeks of school and going inpatient does to a kid that's seven, eight years old with a lower IQ and fetal alcohol syndrome that already had trauma history. Like, I don't know.